Welcome, welcome back to another Read With Me session. Um, This book, Daring Greatly by Brene Brown. We are currently on chapter three, Understanding and Combating Shame, part two of three for this particular chapter. Part one is in the playlist. You can go check it out. But yeah, I'm excited to continue to dive into this chapter and learn more about shame. All right, you're with me? having a haul. Pretty good. Mm -mm -mm. Okay. My name is Vanessa Black. So happy and grateful you are here. And let's do this. Shame resilience is a strategy for protecting connection our connection with ourselves and our connections with the people we care about. But resilience requires cognition or thinking, and that's where shame has a huge advantage. When shame descends, we almost always are hijacked by the limbic system. In other words, the prefrontal cortex, where we do all of our thinking and analyzing and strategizing, gives way to that primitive fight or flight part of our brain. In his book, Incognito, neuroscientist David Eagleman describes the brain as a team of rivals. He writes, there's an ongoing conversation among the different fractions in your brain, each competing to control the single output channel of your behavior. He lays out that the dominant two-party system of reason and emotion. The rational system is the one that cares about analysis of things in the outside world, while the emotional system monitors the internal state and worries whether things are good or bad. Eagleman makes the case that because both parties are battling to control one output behavior, emotions can tip the balance of decision making. I would say that's definitely true when the emotion is shame. Our fight or flight strategies are effective for survival, not for reasoning or connection. And the pain of shame is enough to trigger that survival part of our brain that runs, hides, or comes out swinging. In fact, when I asked the research participants how they normally respond to shame before they started working on shame resilience, I heard many comments like these. When I feel shame, I'm like a crazy person. I do stuff and say stuff I would normally never do or say. Sometimes I just wish I could make other people feel as bad as I do. I just want to lash out and scream at everyone. I get desperate when I feel shame, like I have nowhere to turn, no one to talk to. When I feel ashamed, I check out mentally and emotionally, even with my family. Shame makes you feel estranged from the world. I hide. One time I stopped to get gas and my credit card was declined. The guy gave me a really hard time. As I pulled out of the station, my three-year-old son started crying. I just started screaming, shut up, shut up, shut up. I was so ashamed about my card. I went nuts. Then I was ashamed that I yelled at my son. When it comes to understanding how we defend ourselves against shame, I turned to the wonderful research from the Stone Center at Wellesley. Dr. Linda Hartling, a former relational cultural theorist at the Stone Center, and now the Director of Human Dignity and Humiliation Studies uses the late Karen Horney's work on moving toward, moving against, and moving away. To outline the stage strategies of disconnection we use to deal with shame. According to Dr. Hartling, in order to deal with shame, some of us move away by withdrawing, hiding, silencing ourselves, and keeping secrets. Some of us move toward by seeking to appease and please, and some of us move against by trying to gain power over others, by being aggressive, and by using shame to fight shame, like sending really mean emails. Most of us use all of these at different times with different folks for different reasons, yet all of these strategies move us away from connection. They are strategies for disconnecting from the pain of shame. Here's a story about one of my own shame experiences that brings life to all these concepts. It's one of my best moments, but it's a good example. It's not one of my best moments, but it's a good example of why it's important to cultivate and practice shame resilience if we don't want to heap even more shame on top of a painful situation. First, let me start with a little backstory. Turning down speaking invitations is a vulnerable process for me. 
Years of pleasing and perfecting have left me feeling less than comfortable with disappointing people. The good girl in me hates letting people down. The gremlins whisper, they'll think you're ungrateful and don't be selfish. I also struggle with the fear that if I say no, everyone is going to stop asking. This is when the gremlins say, you want more time to rest? Be careful what you wish for. This work that you love could all go away. My new commitment to setting boundaries come from the 12 years I've spent studying wholeheartedness and what it takes to make the journey from what will people think to I am enough. I like that. What people think to I am enough. The most connected and compassionate people of those I've interviewed set and respect boundaries. I don't just want to research and travel all of the time talking about being wholehearted. I want to live it. That means that I turn down about 80% of the speaking requests that I receive. I say yes when it works with my family calendar, my research commitments, and my life. Well, last year I received an email from a man who was really angry with me because I wasn't able to speak at an event that he was hosting. I turned down the invitation because it conflicted with a family birthday. The email was mean-spirited and jam-packed with personal attacks. My gremlins were having a field day. Rather than replying, I decided to forward it to my husband along with a little note telling him exactly what I thought about this guy and his email. I needed to discharge my shame and anger. Trust me, it was not good girl email. I can neither conf confirm nor deny using the word horseshit. Twice, I hit reply instead of forward. That The second my Mac laptop made the airplane swooshing sound that it makes when you hit the send button, I scream, come back! Please come back. I was still staring at the screen, totally immobilized by shame, layered on shame when the man fired back a response along the lines of, aha, I knew it. You are a horrible person. You're not wholehearted. You suck. The shame attack was already in full swing. My mouth was dry. Time was slowing down and I was seeing tunnel vision. I struggled to swallow as a gremlin started whispering, you do suck. How could you be so stupid? They always know exactly what to say. As soon as I could catch my breath, I started murmuring, pain, 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 pain. This strategy is the brainchild of Caroline, a woman whom I had interviewed early in my research, and then a couple of years later, after she had been practicing shame resilience. Caroline told me that whenever she felt shame, she immediately started repeating the word pain aloud. Pain, 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 she told me. I'm sure it sounds crazy and I probably look like a nut, but for some reason it really works. Of course it works. It's a brilliant way to get out of lizard brain survival mode and pull that prefrontal cortex back on line. After one or two minutes of pain chanting, I took a deep breath and tried to focus myself. I thought, okay, shame attack. I'm okay. What's next? I can do this. I recognize the physical symptoms which allow me to reboot my thinking brain and remember the three ninja warrior gremlin moves that are the most effective path to shame resilience for me. And fortunately, I've been practicing these moves long enough to know that they're totally counterintuitive and I have to trust the process. Pain, pra or practice number one, practice courage and reach out. Yes, I want to hide. But the way to fight shame and to honor who we are is by sharing our experience with someone who has earned the right to hear it. Someone who loves us, not despite our vulnerabilities, but because of them. Talk to myself. Number two is talk to myself the way I would talk to someone I really love and whom I'm trying to comfort in the midst of a meltdown. You're okay. You're human. We all make mistakes. I've got your back. Normally during a shame attack, we talk to ourselves in ways we would never talk to people we love and respect. Number three, own the story. Don't bury it and let it fester or define me. I often say this aloud. Quote, if you own the story, you can get to write the ending. If you own the story, you get to write the ending. When we bury the story, we forever stay the subject of the story. If we own the story, we get to narrate the ending. 
As Carl Jung said, I am not what has happened to me. I am what I choose to become. Even though I knew that the most dangerous thing to do after a shaming experience is to hide or bury our story, I was afraid to make the call, but I did. I called both my husband, Steve, and my good friend, Karen. They gave me what I needed the most, empathy, the best reminder that we're not alone. Rather than judgment, which exaggerates shame, empathy conveys a simple acknowledgement. You're not alone. Empathy is connection. It's a ladder out of the shame hole. Not only did Steve and Karen help me climb out by listening and loving me, but they made themselves vulnerable by sharing that they too had spent some time in the shame, same hole. Empathy doesn't require that we have the exact same experiences as the person sharing the story with us. Neither Karen nor Steve had sent an email like that, but they were both in intimately familiar with the imposter gremlins and the getting caught feeling and the oh shit experience. Empathy is connecting with the emotion that someone is experiencing, not the event or the circumstance. Shame dissipated the minute I realized that I was not alone, that my experience was human. Interestingly, Steve and Karen's response were totally different. Steve was more serious and more, oh man, I know that feeling. Karen took an approach that had me laughing in about 30 seconds. What the responses shared in common was a power of me too. Empathy is a strange and powerful thing. There is no script. There is no right way or wrong way to do it. Simply listening, holding space, withholding judgment with, with, holding judgment, emotionally connecting, and communicating that incredibly healing message of you're not alone. My conversations with Steve and Karen allowed me to move forward, mo move through shame, get back on my emotional feet, and respond to the man's I knew it email from a place of authenticity and self-worth. I own my part in the angry exchange and apologize for my inappropriate language. I also set clear boundaries around future communications. I never heard from him again. Shame thrives on secret keeping. And when it comes to secrets, there's some serious science behind this 12 step program saying you're only as sick as your secrets. In a pioneering study, psychologist and university of Texas, professor James Pennebaker and his colleagues studied what happened when trauma survivors, specifically rape and incest survivors, kept their experiences secret. The research team found that the act of not discussing a traumatic event or confiding it to another person could be more damaging than the actual event. Conversely, when people share their stories and experiences, their physical health improved. Their doctors visited decrease and they showed significant decreases of stress and stress in their stress hormones. Since his early work on the effects of secret keeping, Pennant Baker has focused much of his research on healing power of expressive writing. In his book, Writing to Heal, Pennant Baker writes, since the mid 1980s, an increasing number of studies have focused on the value of expressive writing as a way to bring about healing. The evidence is mounting that the act of writing about traumatic experience for as little as 15 or 20 minutes a day for three or four days can produce measurable changes in physical and mental health. Emotional writing can also affect people's sleep habits, work efficiency, and how they connect with others. Shame resilience is a practice, and like Pennant Baker, I think writing about our shame experience is an incredibly powerful component of the practice. It takes time to cultivate the practice and courage to reach out and talk about hard things. If you're reading this and thinking, I'd like to be able to have these conversations with my partner or my friend or my child, do it. If you're reading it and thinking shame has become a management style around here and it's no wonder that folks are disengaged, we should talk about this. Do it. You don't need to figure it out first or master the information before you engage in conversation. You just have to say, I've been reading a book and there's a chapter about shame. I'd love to talk about it with you. If I lend you my book, will you take a look? The next section is about men, women, shame, and worthiness. I think you'll want to lend them this chapter as well. What I learned about men and shame changed my life. Webs and Boxes, How Men and Women Experience Shame Differently, page 83. 
For the first four years of my study on shame, I focused solely on women. At that time, many researchers believed, and some today still believe, that men and women's experiences of shame are different. I was concerned that if I combined the data from men and women, I'd miss some of the important nuances of their experiences. That I opted to just interview women, I confess, was partially due to my mindset when it came to worthiness. Women were the ones struggling at some level. I also think my resistance was based on an intuitive sense that interviewing men would be like stumbling into a new and strange world. As it turns out, it was definitely a strange new world, a world of unspoken hurt. I got a glimpse into the world in 2005 at the end of one of my lectures. A tall, thin man who I guess was in his early 60s followed his wife to the front of the room. He was wearing a yellow Izod golf sweater. An image I'll never forget. I spoke with his wife for a few minutes as I signed a stack of books that she'd bought for herself and her daughters. As she started to walk away, her husband turned to her and said, I'll be right there. Give me a minute. She clearly didn't want him to stay and talk to him. She tried coaxing him with a couple of commands, but he didn't budge. I, of course, was thinking, go with her, dude. You're scaring me. After a few success- unsuccessful attempts, she walked toward the back of the room and he turned to face me at my book signing table. It started innocently enough. I like what you have to say about shame, he told me. It's interesting. I thanked him and waited. I could tell there was more coming. He leaned in closer and asked, I'm curious, what about men and shame? What have you learned about us? I felt instant relief. This wasn't going to take long because I didn't know much, I explained. I haven't done many interviews with men. I just study women. He nodded and said, well, that's convenient. I felt the hair on the back of my neck stand up in defense. I forced a smile and asked, why convenient? In the very high voice that I use when I'm uncomfortable, he replied by asking me if I really wanted to know. I told him yes, which was a half truth. I was on my guard. Then his eyes welled up with tears. He said, we have shame, deep shame. But when we reach out and share our stories, we get the emotional shit beat out of us. I struggled to maintain eye contact with him. His raw pain had touched me, but I was still trying to protect myself. Just as I was about to make a comment about how hard men are on each other, he said, before you say anything about those mean mean coaches, bosses, brothers, and fathers being the only ones, he pointed toward the back of the room where his wife was standing and said, my wife and daughters, the ones you signed all of those books for, they'd rather see me die on top of my white forest then watch me fall off. You say you want us to be vulnerable and real, but come on, you can't stand it. It makes you sick to see us like that. Holding my breath, I had this very visceral reaction to what he was saying. It hit me the way only truth can. He let out a long sigh and as quickly as he had begun, he said, that's all I wanted to say. Thanks for listening. And then just walked away. I had spent years researching women and hearing their stories to struggle. In that moment, I realized that men have their own stories and that if we're going to find our way out of shame, it will be together. So this section is about what I've learned about women, men, how we hurt each other, and how we need each other to heal. What I've come to believe about men and women now that I've studied both is that men and women are equally affected by shame. The messages and expectations that fuel shame are most definitely organized by gender. But the experience of shame is universal and deeply human. Woman and the shame web. When I asked women to share their definitions or experiences of shame, here's what I heard. Look, perfect. Do perfect. Be perfect. Anything less than that is shaming. Being judged by others, by other mothers. Being exposed, the flawed parts of yourself that you want to hide from everyone are revealed. No matter what I achieve or how far I've come, where I come from and what I've survived will always keep me from feeling like I'm good enough. Even though everyone knows that there's no way to do it all, everyone still expects it. Shame is when you can't pull off looking like it's under control. Never enough at home, never enough at work, never enough in bed, never enough with my parents. Shame is never enough. No seat at the cool table, the pretty girls are laughing. 
If you recall the 12 shame categories, appearance and body image, money and work, motherhood, fatherhood, family, parenting, mental and physical health, addiction, sex, aging, religion, surviving trauma, and being stereotyped or labeled, the primary trigger for women in terms of its power and universality, universality is the first one, how we look. Still, after all the consciousness raising and critical awareness, we still feel the most shame about not being thin, young, and beautiful enough. Interestingly, in terms of shame triggers for women, motherhood is a close second. And bonus, you don't have to be a mother to experience mother shame. Society views womanhood and motherhood as inextricably bound. Therefore, our value as women is often determined by where we are in relation to our roles as mothers or potential mothers. Women are constantly asked why they haven't married or if they're married, why they haven't had children. Even women who are married and have one child are often asked why they haven't had a second child. You had your kids too far apart, question mark. What were you thinking, question mark. Too close, question mark. Why, question mark. That's so unfair to the kids. If you're working outside the home, the first question is what about the children? If you're not working, the first question is what kind of example are you setting for your daughters? Mother shame is ubiquitous. It's a birthright for girls and women. But the real struggle for women, what amplifies shame regardless of the category, is that we are expected and sometimes desire to be perfect, yet we're not allowed to look as if we're working for it. We want it to just materialize somehow. Everything should be effortless. The expectation is to be natural beauties, natural mothers, natural leaders, and naturally good parents. And we want to belong to naturally fabulous families. Think about how much money has been made selling products that promise the natural look. And when it comes to work, we love to hear she makes it look so easy or she's a natural. As I found myself reading through the pages of definitions and examples provided by women, I kept envisioning a web what I saw was a sticky, complex spiderweb of layered, conflicting, and competing expectations that dictate exactly who we should be, what we should be, how we should be. When I think of my own efforts to be everything to everyone, something that women are socialized to do, I can see how every move I make just ensnares me even more. Every effort to twist my way out of the web just leads to becoming more stuck. That's because every choice has consequences or leads to someone being disappointed. The web is a metaphor for the classic double bind situation. Writer Marilyn Fry describes a double bind as a situation in which options are very limited and all of them expose us to penalties, sen censure, or deprivation. If you take competing and conflicting expectations, which are often unattainable from the get-go, you have this. And these are the points. Be perfect, but don't make a fuss about it. And don't take time away from anything like your family or your partner or your work or to achieve your perfection. If you're really good, perfection should be easy. Don't upset anyone or hurt anyone's feeling, but say what's on your mind. Dial the sexuality way up. After the kids are down, the dog is walked, and the house is clean, but dial it way down at the PTO meeting. And geez, whatever you do, don't confuse the two. You know how we talk about those PTO sex pots. Just be yourself, but not if it means being shy or unsure. There's nothing sexier than self-confidence, especially if you're young and smoking hot. Don't make people feel uncomfortable, but be honest. Don't get too emotional, but don't be too detached either. Too emotional and you're hysterical. Too detached and you're cold-hearted B-I-T-C-H. In a U.S. study on conformity to feminine norms, researchers recently listed the most important attributes associated with being feminine as being nice, pursuing a thin body ideal, showing modesty by not calling attention to one's talents or abilities, being domestic, caring for children, investing in a, a romantic relationship, keeping sexual intimacy contained within one committed relationship, and using our resources to invest in our appearance. Basically, we have to be willing to stay as small, sweet, and quiet as possible and use our time and talent to look pretty. Our dreams, ambitions, and gifts are unimportant. 
God forbid that some young girl who has a cure for cancer tucked away in her abilities finds the list and decides to follow the rules. If she does, we'll never know her genius, and I feel sure of that. Why? Because every successful woman whom I've interviewed has talked to me about the sometimes daily struggle to push past the rules so she can assert herself, advocate her ideas, and feel comfortable with her power and gifts. Even to me, the issue of stay small, sweet, quiet, and modest sounds like an outdated problem, but the truth is that women still run into those demands whenever we find and use our voices. When the TEDx Houston video went viral, I wanted to hide. I begged my husband, Steve, to hack into the TED website and bring the entire thing down. I fantasized about breaking into the offices where they were keeping the video and stealing it. I was desperate. That was when I realized that I had to unconsciously work throughout my career to keep my work small. Uh, I loved writing for my community of readers because preaching to the choir is easy and relatively safe. The quick and global spread of my work was exactly what I had always tried to avoid. I didn't want the exposure and I was terrified of the mean-spirited criticism that's so rampant in internet culture. Well, that mean spiritedness happened and the vast majority of it was directed to reinforcing those norms that we'd love to believe are outdated. When a news outlet shared the video on their site, a heated debate erupted in the comments section of their website about, of course, my weight. How can she talk about worthiness when she clearly needs to lose 15 pounds? On another site, a debate grew about the appropriateness of mothers having breakdowns. I feel sorry for her children. Good mothers don't fall apart. Another comment worse, less research, more Botox. Something similar happened when I wrote an article on imperfection for CNN.com. To accompany the article, the editor used a photo I had taken of a good friend who had I am enough written across the top of her chest. It's a beautiful photo that I have hanging in my study as a reminder. Well, that fuel comments like she may believe that she's enough, but by the look of that chest, she could use some more. And if I look like Brene Brown, I'd embrace imperfection too. I know that these examples are symptomatic of the cruelty culture that we live in today and that everyone is fair game, but think about how and what they chose to attack. They went for my appearance and my mothering. Two kill shots taken straight from the list of feminine norms. They didn't go after my intellect or my arguments. That wouldn't hurt enough. So no, those societal norms aren't outdated. Even if they're reductionist and squeeze the life out of us, and shame is a route to enforcing them, which is another reminder of why shame resilience is a prerequisite for vulnerability. I believe I dared greatly in my TEDx Houston talk. Talking about my struggles was a courageous thing for me to do, given my drive to self-protect and use research as armor. And the only reason I'm still standing and writing this book here sitting is because I've cultivated some pretty fierce shame resilience skills and I'm crystal clear that courage is an important value to me. I clearly saw that these comments triggered shame in me and I could quickly reality check the messages. Yes, they still hurt. Yes, I was pissed. Yes, I cried my eyes out. Yes, I wanted it to disappear, but I gave myself permission to feel these things for a couple of hours or days. And I reached out, talked through my feelings with people I trust and love, and I moved on. I felt more courageous, more compassionate, more connected. I also stopped reading anonymous comments. If you're not in the arena with the rest of us fighting and getting your ass kicked on occasion, I'm not interested in your feedback. How men experience shame. When I asked men to define shame or give me an answer, here's what I heard. Shame is failure at work, on the football field, in your marriage, in bed, with money, with their children. It doesn't matter. Shame is failure. Shame is being wrong, not doing it wrong, but being wrong. Shame is a sense of being defective. Shame happens when people think you're soft. It's degrading and shaming to be seen as anything but tough. Revealing any weakness is shaming. Basically, shame is weakness. 
Showing fear is shameful. You can't show fear. You can't be afraid no matter what. Shame is being seen as the guy you can shove up against the lockers. Our worst fear is being criticized or ridiculed. Either one of these is extremely shaming. Basically, men live under the pressure of one unrelenting message. Do not be perceived as weak. Whenever my graduate students were going to do interviews with men, I told them to prepare for three things. High school stories, sports metaphors, and the word pussy. If you're thinking that you can't believe I just wrote that, I get it. It's one of my least favorite words. But as a researcher, I know it's important to be honest about what emerged. And that word came up all the time in the interviews. It didn't matter if the man was 18 or 80. If I asked, what's the same message? The answer was, don't be a P-U-S-S-Y. When I first started writing about my work with men, I used the image of a box, something that looked like a shipping crate. To explain how shame traps men, like demands on women to be naturally beautiful, thin and perfect at everything, especially motherhood. The box has rules that tell men that they should and shouldn't do what they should and shouldn't do and who they're allowed to be. But for men, every rule comes back to the same mandate. Don't be weak. I'll never forget when a 20 year old man who was part of a small group of college students that I was interviewing said, let me show you the box. I know he was a tall guy, but when he stood up, it was clear that he was at least six foot four. He said, imagine living like this as he crouched down and pretended that he was stuffed inside a small box. Still hunched over, he said, you really only have three choices. You spend your life fighting to get out, throwing punches at the side of the box and hoping it will break. You always feel angry and you're always swinging or you just give up. You don't give a shit about anything. At that point, he slumped over on the ground. You could have heard a pin drop in the room. Then he stood up, shook his head and said, or you stay high so you don't really notice how unbearable it is. That's the easiest way. The students grabbed on to stay high like a life preserver and broke into nervous laughter. This happens a lot when you're talking about shame or vulnerability, anything to cut the tension. But this brave young man wasn't laughing and neither was I. His demonstration was one of the most honest and courageous things I've ever had the privilege of seeing. And I know that the people in that room were deeply affected by it. After the group interview, he told me about his experiences growing up. He had been a passionate artist as a child, and he winced as he described how he was sure from an early age that he'd be happy if he could spend his life painting and drawing. He said that one day he was in the kitchen with his dad and uncle. His uncle pointed to a collection of his art that was plastered on the refrigerator and said jokingly to his father, what, you're raising a faggot artist now? Question mark. After that, he said his father, who had always been neutral about his art, forbade him from taking classes. Even his mother, who had always been so proud of his talent, agreed that it was a little too girly. He told me that he'd drawn a picture of his house the day before all of this happened, and to that day it was the last thing he'd ever drawn. That night I wept for him and for all of us who never got to see his work. I think about him all the time and hope he has reconnected with his art. I know it's a tremendous loss for him, and I'm equally positive that the world is missing out. And that concludes this particular part of Chapter 3, Understanding and Combating Shame. We'll love to know your thoughts. We have one more part to end this particular chapter. It's deep. It's great. The insight, the information, the research, men and women, absolutely phenomenal. We'd love to know your thoughts and your feedback and appreciate you. I'll see you in the next Read With Me session as we conclude chapter three and part three. So stay close. We'll see you and looking forward to hearing your feedback. Give this a like if you like this. Give Brene Brown a shout out on Instagram or on here. Um, she's really, really amazing and courageous and we appreciate you. All right. We'll see you in the next Read With Me session. I'm Vanessa Black, one of the owners and founders of Billionaire Rat, where we are on a mission we have a vision of impacting billions of souls all over the world to achieve personal freedom in their life, as well as financial freedom. And I hope so many of you listening in have gotten so much freedom personally by listening to this information. All right. I believe in you. I appreciate you. You're beautiful. You're amazing. And you are courageous. We'll see you in the next episode. Talk to you soon.